for the touch of your lips, dear, but much more for the touch of your whips, dear. You can raise welts like nobody else as we dance to the masochism tango. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Ourgasm. This is the podcast where we talk about decolonizing sexuality and gender. I am Lindsay G. I use she, her, or they, them pronouns. And I am Lenny Peppers. I use she, her pronouns. And I am Amanda Barr, and I also use she, her pronouns. Awesome. Uh, We are really, really excited to talk to everybody today on the topic of sex and disability. Uh, But before we dive into that, Lenny, take it away. Um, In this podcast... We use the heteronormative terms of gender binary of men and women under the understanding that there are agender, androgynous, bigender, pangender, and gender fluid norms that exist outside of cisnormativity. While we tend to use male and female as shorthand, this is not meant to undermine the very serious role of colonization in violence against two-spirit and non-conforming individuals. Even more so, This is not meant to obscure the reality that two-spirit and non-conforming people are the most likely to experience sexual violence, as we have mentioned in, as we have mentioned in earlier episodes. We do not believe in the gender binary without fluidity, which is a Euro-Western construct that forced a strict gender division on our societies, which itself is a form of violence. Very fucking true. Thank you, Lenny. Uh, so everyone, I am excited to say that on our podcast today, we have the amazing Amanda Barr and Amanda is here to talk with us about sex and disability, but I keep putting this off. I keep saying, let's just wait a second until we start talking about it. But Amanda, (laughs) can you tell us and our listeners a little bit about where you're coming from and, you know, what your deal is? Yeah. So, uh, me right now, I am doing an MFA in studio arts and an MA in art history. Whoa. But uh, previously I was, I had an MA in Spanish and modern languages. And I was, I've been in education for around 14 years now, which, you know, has, is pretty much because of, growing up as a kid with disabilities and a student with disabilities who went through a lot of abuse and a failure of the education system to protect me and to not only protect me, but to serve me. And I think that's really how I ended up going into a field like, like language, because I wanted to communicate. I loved the idea of learning other languages, uh, along with the history and culture um, that are attached, just in, in a way to be able to reach out and communicate with more people than just those who share my language and culture. And in that, you know, becoming an educator was a way to teach others to do that. And I learned really quickly in, in my undergrad that I was pretty good in the classroom setting, mostly because I do have this, this kind of in with students in that I understand what it's like to come from, from the struggle of, of learning access and, and, you know, not really being expected to do much, so not being given any attention. Hmm. And it, 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 in my experience as an educator, it's given me a different insight into the student experience. So it, it allows me to kind of transform my classroom, at least, into one that includes people despite what obstacles they are facing. Hmm. So after first grad school, I kind of got a little more into art as a coping mechanism for some stuff I was going through. And it, it really 
snowballed and ended up (laughs) being something that I wanted to get more into and teach. So I came back for an MFA and I really like art history. So I added that degree because it was available. Yeah. (laughs) And absolutely love all of that. Actually, that's a little bit about how Amanda and I uh, met. Uh, My PhD is in kind of art and media as resilience. And so uh, our paths were bound across in this little town, no matter what. <laughs> yeah. 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 So um, like just a personal history, I was diagnosed when I was five with what was then called petite mal epilepsy, which um, is now termed absence seizures. So not the grand mal oh, that right. everyone's kind of familiar with when you say seizure. Yeah. Mine were more um, just like flicking the light switch off and then back on again. Okay. Is my brain would just shut down for a second Hmm. and then I'd be back. But by the time I'd be back, I will have lost muscle control and often bladder control. And then sometimes it's so quick that it's just like I paused to think about what I was saying for a little too long and then um, caught back up with the conversation. So my parents thought I was just a real space cadet of a kid. Oh, yeah. I didn't realize that what I was actually um, doing was having seizures. So they just thought I was really ditzy for a long time. Oh, wow. And I had chronic migraines to go with that because when your brain is really stressed, with the seizures, um, you will have migraines and headaches. And yeah. so from such a young age, I didn't realize my head wasn't supposed to hurt all the time. Like I thought that's just how oh. you felt. Uh-huh. And so like, I would say like, I think my head hurts, but I didn't know what the scale was for that. Yeah. yeah. I had no comprehension of it. And so I was having what most people would consider a debilitating migraine Mm -hmm. like constantly like that was my level um which was cool to find out and actually start getting treated because I was like wow it doesn't hurt to have the lights on yeah (laughs) wow so then a few years ago I I I also found out that I have um some kind of connective tissue disorder similar to Ehlers-Danlos and but uh, it is unspecified for now, which is cool. Oh, yeah, fun, fun, fun. <laughs> I'm sure. And uh, as well, I, I from like, decades of neglect and abuse, both in my childhood and as an adult, I have been diagnosed with chronic PTSD. Yeah. So I'm oh. just a whole ball of fun. Well, <laughs> I, I'm having fun so far. I don't know. <laughs> With you, I mean. Um, yeah. Wow. Well, but I mean, it's super freaking awesome to me that you are, that you've sort of made it your mission to provide for other people what you didn't have provided for you as mm-hmm. a student. Yeah. And honestly, that's how I've always phrased it. Like, I just want to, want other students to have the kind of support and the resources that I never got. Yeah. Because it's been so hard for me. Like I was told I wasn't going to graduate high school. I missed so many days of school and Mm -hmm. they didn't think my brain had the capacity to really get beyond that. Wow. And I've had to sort of fight for everything, you know, to sit, to get accomplish anything in life. It's like, well, you, I mean, I don't know if you could do that. I don't know if that's a good idea. You mm-hmm. hear that a lot. Like, yeah. are you sure you're capable of that? So, you know, just to, to show people that it's a possibility, but to also to like help make those barriers lower and provide a little more access. Yeah. 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 And there's, I think, a huge value for 
young people like at any at any stage of the education process particularly to be taught by an educator who is open about those obstacles that they've faced and um because it it just i feel like this is probably something that we're going to be talking about a lot today so i'm just going to like go for it and say something that i feel a little weird saying but like it it's not often that we see someone in a position of authority that we can understand to have disabilities. Um, and yeah. I recognize, like, I I still really, really grapple with this in my own life. Like, um, I grew up with rheumatoid arthritis from the time that I was literally an infant. Um, and I have <clears throat> sort of a similar situation to what you mentioned, which was like, growing up in constant physical pain, but I had, like, no concept of it. It just, that was just life. And, like, um, I've been medicated for pretty much my entire life. Like, these are just normal things to me. And it's interesting, like, as I get older, that I start to look around and realize my own limitations physically. Because um, as I get older, they get worse <laughs> physically. Um, but I realized that, like, I don't think I ever thought of myself as someone who's affected by disability and that, that a lot of that might be because I just never, I never saw anyone with disabilities that looked anything like mine. So I just didn't, I didn't put myself in that group, but it's kind of like I'm looking back over my life and it's like, well, yeah, I definitely am a disabled person. That's a whole conversation. Um, my, my mother to this day is like, don't call yourself disabled. Mm. You're not disabled. And I'm like, yeah, uh, yes, I am actually. Um, and that messaging that disabled was bad, mm -hmm. right? that I got so much as a child that um, it was imperfection, that it made you inferior, uh, that it made you, um, actually, my mom called me defective at times. Like, um, you know, God got this one wrong. This one was oh you my know, factory God. defect. Oh my God, um, I literally once had a doctor do x-rays, and when he brought them back in, like, to look at them with us, he was like, all right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to send you back to God with a note that says, please remake. Ugh. And I was like, I was like 16 and it was, I thought it was a funny joke. So I laughed. And then it was like later, I'm like in the car on my way home and I'm like, holy shit, that was fucked up. <laughs> yeah. But similar. And I had then like, my mom thought it was funny too. So then she repeated it to everybody, you know, and it's, yeah, and that kind of messaging is really, really intensely embedded in our in in a lot of cultures, actually. Like I've heard, um, it's God didn't break the mold with you. It's God should uh, should have replaced the mold before he broke made you because yeah. it was broken. Fuck. And that that extreme amount of messaging that we are defective, that we are, um, you know, not right, that we came out wrong um that oh i loved my mom also still says like well it's a uh, it's my i sinned somehow and you were my pen penance oh my and God. i'm like oh <laughs> the messaging to me in that is so horrific yeah like you have been inflicted on a parent yeah and that is Oh, that's a whole thing, especially with autism and vaccines that I could talk about for years because like when you are like, I'd rather my kid die of measles than get a vaccine and possibly have autism. The messaging oh, right. that people with autism receive from that uh, is supremely fucked. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and there's this, this concept that we call invisible disability. Mm -hmm. Where like with RA and with most of the things I deal with, they're not, people can't see you in a wheelchair. They don't see you using a cane or sign language.